Well, uh, welcome back. That was a great start to the conversation. Um, I'd like to start by picking up on two uh, things that came up in the comments from our live segment. And the first was a question about patient advocacy that Cynthia Mastel raised about whether there is a ministry for churches in patient advocacy or whether that's a specialized position that requires training. Is there anything that we as lay persons can do uh, to help here? Um. Well, uh, the, uh, the short answer is yes, you probably, there, there are things that you can do if um, you want to, to put a ministry in place. I, I think what's important is, you know, having someone who really understands um, hospitals and how they work and, um, and medicine, that kind of stuff. So j just having some basic knowledge um, so that, um, if there's someone who can serve as an advocate for, you know, a family or speak, you know, for a family, um, you know, they would be able to do it. You know, obviously, I think there's some risk to the the church, you know, because it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a important role. Um, you know, when you take this on, I mean, you're you're you're, I mean, you're taking on, you know. Um, you're you're serving in some kind of official capacity, um, so those are the I mean those are the things I think you you have to think about. Um, I think institutions themselves should have as part of quality because that's where we have our patient advocates are a part of our quality, um, making sure that we're that we're doing what we need to do at Methodist Health System to take care of our patients and our families and that we're meeting the needs and so our patients. Our patient advocates advocates are part of quality, and so if even if if we see something as chaplains, um, we can say to the family, "Listen, this, you know, if you didn't like how this felt, or if you didn't like what you got, here's a number. You can call the patient advocate. That person will will get with you. They'll interview you. They'll 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 go and look at your charts. They'll look at everything." And then they'll then they'll start doing the work of figuring out what it is that you need um, you know need to get done. Um, all hospitals have ethics committees, um, and so there's you know there's always ethic reviews that are brought up, and that that can be brought up by patients and by staff. There's a patient bill of rights. People probably don't know that, but every hospital has a patient bill of rights. It should be posted. On the outside of the hospital, it should be posted somewhere where patients can see that and understand and read what their bill of rights are when they come to the hospital. And so, knowing those things, I mean, those are are, are really big things. So, if you, if if I'm thinking of a ministry that would be helpful, it, it would be understanding hospitals, understanding you know patients' bill of rights, all of those things, so that you're educating people on um, all of the things that they would need to know without, you know, putting yourself at risk and, and acting as a mediator yeah. between them and the hospital. So, yeah. So what I hear you saying, I, I want to, if what I hear you saying is correct, you're, what you're describing maybe is a medical literacy program prior to the moment of health care. Yeah. So that we're arming the, the patients or mm -hmm. the individuals with the very kind of literacy we're talking about, mm -hmm. even if it's just, I mean, I wouldn't want to describe a trait to somebody, but just as simple as, hey, did you know you can ask for an interpreter? Mm -hmm. Hey, did you know you can ask for a patient advocate? Hey, yeah. you know, <laughs> did you know, I mean, <laughs> when, when my child was born, we were going to have a, um, we're going to have a natural birth. We would planned for this. We practiced. We'd taken all the classes. We got down to the moment and um, long story. I won't go into, we had, we didn't have our regular OB. We had a, a, you know, on duty, on call. And so she comes in and she says, okay, so we're going to do a C-section. And we said, no, no, no. And she went on all of this, you know, and I could tell, 
that uh, Susan, Will's mother, she doesn't deal with it. I mean, this is not her favorite kind of high stress stakes situation. And so I turned to the, um, uh, the OB and I said, I need two minutes alone with her just to, you know, I just wanted to be able to look her in the eye without the doctor standing there and saying, are you okay with this? Because if you're not, I'll keep fighting. And the doctor looked at me and said, well, okay, but chop, chop. And turn around. <laughs> now, I mean, if I hadn't have been white, male, you know, all of the things that I was, I might not have felt like I could have told the doctor, time out, we need to slow this train down. Um, and even just telling them, look, you have the right to say, slow down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, unless there's blood going out on the floor, I need a little bit more time. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to make light of a right, right. period of, of emergent situations. But, but you have the right to you have to the right to determine your health care, and and your it it's not it doesn't it doesn't it's not like it just automatically you know you can stop wherever you want to even if the treatment can save your life. I mean, I've, you know, there was a patient who, um, I mean, we had a patient who refused blood for religious reasons. And um, it, I mean, it was his wife didn't want her husband to, to receive blood for religious reasons because of that, because of um, their religious designation. And because of that, um, we, we didn't give them blood that, that was put on the, the chart. Um, the patient ended up dying from not having enough blood, but 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 that's the power of being able to choose, um, and it should be respected to that point. That if you refuse, that you don't want whatever treatment is, you, you know, you should be be able to do that. It's trickier with kids, and I think you know Cassie probably could speak to to some of that, you know, because. Kids can't always speak for themselves. And so, you know, someone has to speak for um, what is in the best interest of that child so that they get to live their life, you know, to the full extent, too. And so, you know, there, there are all, all types of ethics, uh, ethic reviews and, and conversations that, that go around it. Um, you know, I, I think, you know... It, so I always think in terms of because of where I where I'm located in my own faith and and connected to the North Texas Conference, connected to the Christian Church, and thinking in terms of my own formation, you know, what should I be about as a person who is um, who is um, 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 who calls themselves a Christian? <laughs> and, and, you know, what should my positions be? And, you know, obviously I think, you know, where, where, you know, I, I mean, for me, you know, my, my framework always comes from Jesus's words to his disciples, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That, that from that basis of love, then you begin to frame everything else, which is why, why I go back to the whole argument of you know um, that it is if I could if I could use theological terms it's a sin <laughs> it's a sin to allow race to prevent us from being in community with one another now we can I mean we can talk about it politically and we can talk about all all I'm just talking about you know just as a as a as a person a pastor you know a theologian that looks at this from, um, you know, the Bible and, and the way that I'm, the way that I'm oriented to and understanding God, that, that then when I look at, um, when I look at healthcare, I mean, and those systems that, that, you know, comprehensively, I mean, I think when you look at it comprehensively, um, I have to ask myself, you know, there is a role, there is a very important role for the church to advocate, to, to push the political systems to make sure that systems are right. 
it's not enough just to say, well, you know, I'll I'll do this. But it, I mean, it's all things. It's having a ministry at your church. It's having an advocacy. However, you decide to do that. But it's also pushing pushing bigger systems to make sure that those things change. You, you know, I mean, Greg, you know, Governor Abbott um, would be the first in line to bring health care uh, or Obamacare to Texas and probably fight for it if he felt a lot of pressure from the faith community. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not, that's that hasn't been consistent. But the faith community there is largely impacted by the fact that they can't get access to health care. And it's not, and, and the thing is, is that it's not just, it's not just black and brown people, but it's poor white people that live in rural communities that, that are just not getting the health care they need. Um, think about all the people that have lost their jobs and in the course of this pandemic. They are, they are now without insurance. <laughs> They're without insurance. They have no access to insurance. Now, I had a friend um, who was um, in Indiana, and he he was an administrator, lost his job, lost his insurance. But because Indiana was part of the uh, accountable care, he was able to get insurance. He was able to continue having access to 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 health care and to doctors and to test and to all the things that he needed to have. Um, the, you, you've also mentioned rural communities mm -hmm. and I don't, I, I don't know what the stats are, but I know we see increasingly uh, high rates of hospital closures in rural communities. Yeah. So that just by the virtue of the fact that communities are rural, their their distance from health care is growing. Yes. Um, because they're not able to support hospitals. Right. And uh, with ho hospitals, I assume, go doctors. Yes. Um, and certainly specialists. Yes. Um, so this is another access issue. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got advocacy at this at the large systemic level that we've talked about. And I want to return to advocacy at the personal level. Um, Cassie, you um, you said you didn't know about a specific patient advocate position in your context, but it sounded like from what you described, the psychosocial team, team that, that there's actually a very broad system uh, for advocacy built into your system? Uh, yeah, I, I would say so. Um, I only have experience in a handful of hospitals, um, and I would say that right now my current context probably has the um, most integrated psychosocial aspect um, that, I, that I've experienced. Um, and that, I mean, Caesar mentioned like ethics, like our ethics team is also very involved in everything that we're doing. Um, and so, yeah, I think that there's patient advocacy kind of built into our system. Um, and still, you know, things are going to fall through or someone's not going to get access to that based on larger, you know, systemic administrative barriers, um, personal biases, things of that nature. Um, and it, yes, I, I would agree that rural communities have less access to um, healthcare. And like in the pediatric world, so, you know, there's only a handful of level one pediatric trauma centers, which is like the highest level of emergency care you can get. Um, so, like Baylor Scott and White Hospital is a level one. I think Methodist Dallas is also level one. Yeah. Um, but the next closest level one pediatric center from the DFW area is gonna be like Texas Children's in Houston. Um, so we, like we in the DFW area and also in Houston see patients from across state lines because we are the closest hospitals that will 
be able to handle their care, especially if you have a complex medical diagnosis and your child needs constant things. Like it's, it's not infrequent that we have families who travel once every two weeks from Lubbock to come here for their care with their physicians. So, um, and who pays for that travel? Well, their insurance, if they have it, if not, you know, we would hope that they have CHIP or Medicaid, um, which CHIP was almost fully dismantled in the last few years as well. Um, and if not that, then it would be emergency medicine because it would be whatever fire rescue, you know, 911 responder that's going to then contract out to like a care flight or any other medical helicopter that's going to be able to take them to where wherever can get them the best care. And so, so you've got now someone who is maybe economically disadvantaged from a rural area, or not even rural. I mean, we wouldn't consider Lubbock rural, right? Yeah. Um, but <laughs> no, for the record, it's not. We at St. Stephen do not consider Lubbock rural. <laughs> we may consider it the West, but we don't consider it rural. <laughs> um, so now they have the burden of transfer, uh, transportation into the city. And I assume that like once they get in the DFW area, you don't like just have a hotel suite uh, gratis for the family to stay overnight or two nights or six nights, however long the treatment is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And that's where, you know, nonprofits and charities come into place because you know, if you have insurance, then you can't have insurance cover your hotel. Medicaid has some housing allowance as well if you don't get into Ronald McDonald House, which is the number one medical housing charity that I've that I've heard of and that I've experienced. Um, and even that is an application process, and you can't stay there if you have anything on your record. Um, you can't have people under 18 staying there with you. There's a lot of other barriers built into that system that is the most free and available one there is. So I'm just going to stop and put a plug here. A plug. <laughs> this is why collecting the uh, pop top can tabs at St. Stephen is so critical. I went through the cans uh, just this weekend. And do you know how many pull tabs I found in there that people had not pulled off their cans? Every gallon of those tabs that we turn in turns into a free night for someone to stay at the Ronald McDonald House, okay? And it's not someone who can afford it, right? These are people who already come into the system at a disadvantage. So I know this seems ridiculous to St. Stephen friends, but pull those pull tabs, okay? Okay, that's the end of my plug. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I think you, I, I, I absolutely did. And, and it's great. It's advocacy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. I want to, I, part of what um, John's question, or well, more John's statement about the mental health um, realities, especially for uh, communities of color, um, I think in a lot of cases are often rooted in trust of the medical system. And so I wonder if either of you, both of you, can speak a little bit to how you've seen, um, either how you've seen that lack of trust or maybe how you've worked with others to try to strengthen or build that trust back up. So um, I think it's a, it's a great question because mental health is, is you know, I mean, I mean, those things go hand in hand with physical health. And I think, um, you know, black and brown com communities are disproportionately um, impacted by, you know, um, poor having poor mental health um, and access to mental health care. Um, um, I, I think that so when I think in terms of just, you know, the thought of mental health and why there's a resistance, 
to it is number one, it's about vulnerability. Um, you know, as an African American man, um, to say that um, I'm sad or grieving and that I need some grief counseling is now a, a place of vulnerability. Partic it's, a, it's a tough place to be, particularly if you live in a world where you're always attacked and, and you can't allow your vulnerabilities to be seen, which in and of itself produces more mental illness. <laughs> it produces more stress. And so can I just stop you right there? Because I for our white listeners, I want you to hear real I want you to listen really carefully here. The resistance, uh I'm gonna use that word, or, or the the fear of of allowing oneself to be vulnerable as a black person is not something that we can say, oh, that's their problem. Oh, that's just their cultural, you know, they just need to get over their cultural thing. They are living in a situation where vulnerability could equal death. Right. So to be vulnerable, to, to culturally, you know, be, to eschew vulnerability, that's not just something you like, that this is a this is life saving. This is life preserving. Um, I I sorry. I yeah no. Again, this is something. This is some excavating that often we have to do as white people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Go, go on what you were saying. I, and 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 then I think on top of that is there's there's this stigma. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As a black man, we're, you know, I think James Cone says it best, you know, you, 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 when you do theology, you, you can't, you cannot think about God when precisely because the world that you live in has defined you, has they, they've defined you as a black, as a black man. You, know, you, you don't know this until it's, until, until you run into society. I mean, I, I didn't think I was any different than any other kids I grew up with until, you know, I started to grow. And then I was like, oh, I am. I'm different because I'm getting this this different experience. And so I think because of that, it's like, OK, now there's there's this other stigma that's going to be placed on me by the broader by the broader um, culture. So, you know, not only not only. Um, you know, I'm the other, but I'm also the other now because I'm not mentally healthy. And so now I can't, I can't claim, I can't claim what every other human being can claim in terms of, I can't claim depression. I can't claim schizophrenia. I can't, I can't, claim any of those things that can be a part of my family um, because it would be seen as another stigma that you have to deal with and that you have to fight against. And so, you know, you, I mean, you know, I, well, I mean, when you talk about systemic racism, I, I, I you know, I think, you know, I, I it's funny because I've been thinking about it a lot. It's like, you know, we have to, we, we, and I'm saying we, and I think it does begin with the faith communities. We have to, we have to use what we have before us to deal with this issue of race. And, and it means having a real honest dialogue about the history that race has played in this country. Um, we cannot get around the fact that black people were brought here and enslaved and for and, and they were brought here and enslaved because they were black and that when the Constitution was written and when laws were put in place, put in place, all those things were done, not with having black people in mind to participate in democracy. It was to subjugate and use as an economic tool to help drive um financiers and banks and all of those the, the bottom line to to keep democracy for 
basically white men because white women weren't getting <laughs> any better treatment either. And so it was it was a certain group that was getting this. And so it's we got to have an honest, honest discussion about it. And then I think, you know. Um, I always I always think 12 steps is really good for this because, it, you know, they give good language for it. We have to make amends. I mean, making amends is just making amends. Making making amends is not good for the other person. It's actually good for me. <laughs> I mean, making amends is about my spiritual condition. And so it is about, you know, having, it's it's about making amends and speaking in that way. What is it that we've done to, to, to black and brown people in this country and make, and speak honestly about it, make amends and then work to make it right. We're, no, we're not ever gonna change. We're not ever going to be able to go and recapture the lives that have, you know, give, you know, all of those things. But but how can we then now start to, to become aware of, of this in a way that allows us to think broadly? teaching what we teach in, in, in school. I mean, I was just thinking about my education. Um, I was telling somebody, I had a discussion with someone else about this. Um, and I was just talking about white supremacy. I said, here's where white supremacy shows up. I said, it's not, it's not somebody that shows up in your life with this hood and they, <laughs> and they the grand wizard of the KKK. I said, here's where it shows up. It shows up in history. It shows up in history. I was in Oklahoma. I grew up in Oklahoma. There was, there were the Tulsa riots. I never learned about that in Oklahoma history. Never learned about that in Oklahoma history. I never learned about the contributions that Black people made to American history or to world history, because there's a lot of that, you know, contributions that have been made. What I did learn was I learned about the suffering of black people. I learned about slavery. I mean, you know, and that was that was basically all I got. And it was it was it was just a short little chapter. Nothing about nothing about um, nothing about um, um, uh, slavery and nothing about, you know, um, uh, the Tulsa riots, nothing about that, but I learned about the land runs. I learned about the Trail of Tears, um, you know, with the five civilized tribes because my family's part Choctaw too. So you learn about these things, but but it's not until I go to college and my secondary education that I start to learn these things. Well, we all are getting the same education. And I think, you know, there again, you know, when we talk about dismantling and really doing the work, it's it, it really is, you know, doing the work of of talking and looking at how we how we teach this history because embedded in these in these lessons, embedded in these lessons, um, are are um, very subjective messages. Um, and as a sixth grade boy who sits in a class with all white kids and I'm learning about all the all the great heroes and the people that did all this great work. Um, I don't see anybody of color. The only person I see is Martin Luther King. <laughs> I think it's important for us to remember um, or be reminded as we did two weeks ago in our discussion about education disparities uh, it can feel like when we start talking about history that, again, this is a typical white trope that was a long time ago, mm. right? How does that affect us today? Um, and one of the things that, I mean, you know, there hasn't been slavery for generations. But one of the things we talked about in our education disparities um, discussion is that in Mesquite, my generation, if I were black, if I had grown up black in Mesquite, my generation would have gone to school, started school at least, in a one-room schoolhouse with a dirt floor. Mm. That would have been my primary, I'm talking about age, primary age, education experience in Mesquite at my age, which means that I'm raising children with that history, lived history, in my background. 
Now, so it's not far off. And in terms of health care, we know that chronic diseases, uh, chronic conditions uh, have effects for generations, right? Well, we can even talk about things that are happening currently. We're talking about uh, patients not having in, uh, enough information, medical knowledge, um, informed consent. Yeah. I know how many pieces of paper you have to sign before you have a hysterectomy. All right. But there are many, many women who are now finding out that they yeah. had hysterectomies. And they didn't, and they didn't consent. know that that was what was happening. Right. Because they did not speak the language. So now trust is undermined. Right. And that trust is handed down. I mean, that's what I'm. That's what I mean when I'm talking about the history. Healthcare, in and of itself, has a generational history. Right. So mm -hmm. I wonder, Cassie, in the last couple seconds that we have, if you, as as someone who sees parents in a situation with their child being cared for in the system, how does that, how does that manifest in that? context um yeah i mean it goes back to that health literacy piece that we were talking about um and like no statistics no research done just my my personal today looking at it uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah uh the white families that i encounter are much more inclined to ask a lot of questions, to have a full notebook of all the medications their child is taking, to know all of these things and say, well, I, I Googled that this medication might have these side effects, but you're giving them this other medication that might have these side effects. Are those going to be good together? Um, you know, in contrast with uh, black or brown families that are like, okay, yeah, give them, give them that medication. Okay. Like if you're telling me that it's going to work, and that's the only option, then that's what I'm going to do. Whereas if you ask a question and you dig a little bit deeper, I would say there's a majority of the time that there's another option, that there's something else out there. And the, I mean, the physicians are doing the best that they can. They're offering you what they think is the best for this situation. Um, but you know, when you come into especially medically complex kids, there's multiple different service lines working with them. And so one service line may tell you this is the best thing and another service line is going to tell you something different. Well, if you're not, if you don't have the literacy and the, the confidence to ask, well, how do these things come together? Things fall through. You, it might get missed. Um, and, and then you're back into that situation of, well, I, I thought I did everything I could. I brought my child to four different emergency rooms and every time they sent me home with a Z-Pack and then he collapsed in a gas station and was care flighted here and now he's dead because, because I was trying to ask everything but I didn't know what to ask for right. and I didn't know how severe it was to push for it. And so uh, the other thing I hear going on in what you described, Cassie, is that there's a white parent who's modeling what it looks like to advocate within the system in front of a child, who then grows up with a culture of, this is a system that I am to engage with agency, you know, sometimes maybe aggressively, I can push back on it. And in another situation, you have a parent modeling compliance, modeling uh, acquiescence, modeling, not in, you know, any number of things that a child then observes. And so the child learns this is a system I'm supposed to go along with, or this is a system I'm supposed to distrust, or this is a system, you know, whatever that is. And so that gets built into right. um, generational. Generational. Yeah. I, <clears throat> Woo. yeah. Um, Caesar, uh, reminded us so well of our call as Christians. And in the middle of um, what Caesar was saying, I was reminded of Ephesians 4. When Paul is talking about the body of Christ and says that we are to equip each other so that the saints may be built up and that each of us may stand at their full height. 
their full stature in Christ. It seems to me that's one of the key things we talked about today in terms of advocacy, literacy, and agency. We have a calling as Christians to make sure that our brothers and sisters, uh, black and brown and uh, of all color, can stand at their full height, uh, at their full stature, when faced with life-threatening situations, when faced with health care. And so that may be something that we need to ponder about what that looks like. Um, I could go on and talk about some of the work that we've been doing in uh, with the American Red Cross uh, in with blood drives and some of the advocacy I've learned, uh, I mean, the literacy that I've learned and advocacy that I have um, tried to advance in terms of African-American blood donors and individuals that uh, suffer from sickle cell. Um, sickle cell patients can only receive blood from uh, African-American donors. Um, African-American donors are, um, there, there is a low representation of African-American donors in the blood supply because of the trust issues we've talked about. And some sickle cell patients can require up to three transfusions a year, which require up to five to six units. That's 18 units of blood. You know, that's more than 18 donors that are needed to support that one sickle cell patient. Um, so anyway, I, I digress, sorry. <laughs> um, it's something I've become passionate about. <laughs> I, <laughs> I appreciate your time uh, today. Uh, this has been an enriching conversation. And I think that it will probably result in more conversations within our context. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything you want to add? No, good. All right. Friends, we'll look forward to seeing you next week for Face to Face when we discuss costumes and mascots in preparation for um, Halloween at the end of the month. In the meantime, uh, we wish you peace, uh, health, and prosperity. And as Heather likes to say, um, be gentle with yourself, but don't take your foot off the gas. <laughs>